ಚಕ್ಷುರ್ಮಿತಾ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುವೇ ನಮಃ ನಮಃ ಓಂ ವಿಷ್ಣುಪಾದಯ ಕೃಷ್ಣಪೃಷ್ಠಾಯ ಭೂತಲೆ ಶ್ರೀಮತೆ ಭಕ್ತಿ ವೇದಾಂತ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಇತಿಮೇ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಸಾರಸ್ವತಿ ದೇವೆ ಗೌರವಾಣಿ ಪ್ರಚಾರಿಣೆ ನಿರ್ವಿಶೇಷ ಶೂನ್ಯವಾದಿ ಪಾಶ್ಚಾತ್ಯ ದೇಶ ತಾರಿಣೆ ವಾಂಚಾಕಲ್ಪತರೂಪ್ಯ ಕೃಪಾ ಸಿಂಧೂಪ್ಯೇಭ್ಯೋ ವೈಷ್ಣವೇಭ್ಯೋ ನಮೋ ನಮಃ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಪ್ರಭು ನಿತ್ಯಾನಂದ ಶ್ರೀ ಅದ್ವೈತ ಪ್ರಧಾಧರ ಶ್ರೀವಾಸಾದಿ ಗೌರ ಭಕ್ತ ಬಿಂದ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ 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 ಹರೇ 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 ರಾಮ ಹರೇ ರಾಮ 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 ಹರೇ 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 ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಸೊ ನಾ ವಿ ಮೂವ್ ಆನ್ ಇನ್ ಆರ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕಶನ್ ದ ಭಗವೀತಾ ಟು ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ಫಿಫ್ಟೀನ್ ಸೊ ಎಸ್ಟರಿ ಯು ನೀವು ಡಿಸ್ಕಸ್ಡ್ ದ ಥ್ರೀ ಮೋವ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಮಟೀರಿಯಲ್ ನೇಚರ್ ನಾವು ಆಫ್ಟರ್ ದಿಸ್ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಕಂಟಿನ್ಯೂಸ್ ಹಿಸ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕ್ರಿಪ್ಷನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಹಿ ಫೋಕಸಸ್ ಆನ್ ಹಿ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಸೆಡ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ವರ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಫಿಫ್ಟೀನ್ ಆನ್ ದ ಫೋರ್ಟೀನ್ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ದ್ಯಾಟ್ ಹೌ ಬೈ ಪ್ರಾಕ್ಟಿಸಿಂಗ್ ಭಕ್ತಿ one comes to the brahman platform and then he says that brahman that all pervading light is supported by me so in the 15th chapter now we will talk about his position so if we go back to the overall flow of the gita arjuna has asked questions about specific terms in the 13th chapter but broadly his questions are about a world view and krishna has given especially in the middle six chapters of the gita a devotional centered world view so how does a bhakti centered world view relate with the world view that is there associated with the uh, vidyana so krishna has pointed that okay you can analyze the modes but i do to transcend the modes you need to practice bhakti so he krishna is now going to give a further explanation of how this path of analysis can actually bring us to devotion so there is a way to go towards devotion with the heart but there is a way to appreciate devotion even through the path of analysis so to illustrate that now in the 15th chapter what krishna will be doing is that on the spiritual path there are two main things there is sadhya and there is sadhana so sadhana is the means so in the previous chapter in 1426 krishna has said said that mamcha yoga vicharine bhakti yoga ne sevate that by the practice of bhakti we can transcend the modes so he has said that the sadhana is bhakti and then he has said that bhagwan in the sense that there is brahman there is a spiritual platform but all of sp- the spiritual platform the entire spiritual reality it is founded in him it is he sustains as brahmano hi pratishtha so he is the ultimate sadhya so that is mentioned 1427 now both of these will be elaborated in chapter 15 this is a these are statements which require elaboration so it is just like if a doctor says that yes you can take many treatments but this is the best treatment okay i need some explanation why do you think this is the best treatment so like that krishna is now going to give a world view through which he will illustrate the substantiate explain the point that he is making and he starts now in general in the vedas or let's put it this way in the vedic literature vedic literature is a vast body so within these the vedas 
are broadly connected with the karma kant so rigveda has been called by western scholar one of the most materialistic religious books in the world what do you mean by materialistic religious book it is promising you know if you want money if you are bountiful harvest you want children you want this chant this mantra do this do that do that so in that sense it's materialistic it's karma kant now in contrast the upanishads are more associated with gyana kant so krishna in the start of this chapter will draw from a metaphor that is already used in the upanishads and the upanishadic metaphor that is the metaphor of an upside down tree so the very first verse krishna says is about there exists a tree and he'll start with that and essentially he says that this tree has its branches downwards and its roots upwards so he will start with this metaphor and then he will elaborate it further in the broad body of vedic literature different sections focus on different things just like in the bhagavad gita some chapters are focusing on certain things so like that in the vedic literature also different sections focus on different things when krishna is talking about the gyana section so naturally he will draw some things from the the literature that are associated with gyana so he is drawing a metaphor from the upanishad so it's not that krishna is is himself coming up with this metaphor you can say ultimately the upanishads have also come from krishna so in that sense that has all come from him but when krishna is speaking to arjuna suddenly when krishna says urdhva mula mala shana arjuna say what is going on over here so if the metaphor had been completely different or completely unfamiliar then arjuna would have had some surprise but arjuna understands is like say in today's world there are so many specific cultural references that we can make which which we understand say for example and to any one audience in the indian world when i talk about you, any audience associated with indians or indians in any part of the world i when i talk about duality i say kabhi khushi everybody completes you know? <laughs> so now now kabhi khushi kabhi khushi kabhi dukhi ho sakta hai but you know they don't use that because that has a there's a particular cultural nomenclature associated with it so so for that it is familiar to everyone into the audience so like that for arjuna this particular metaphor is something which he is aware of but krishna will develop that meta- metaphor in particular ways so let's look at the metaphor first and then we'll move forward urdhva moolam moolam is roots are upwards adha shakham shakham is the branches they go downwards ashvatha Ashwatthama is a banyan tree. Now, Ashwatthama, there are some different concepts, scholars who say that what what exactly does this tree refer to? But generally, it's associated with a banyan tree. And the one idea of the banyan tree is that it also has branches going downwards. You know, it has like further supporting roots going downwards. So it is very strongly uh, rooted in the world. It's very difficult to cut that tree. So in that sense, it's an apt metaphor. Prahur Avyan. There is a tree. it is said to be and it is away up it continues to exist forever urdhva mula madha shakham urdhva mula madha shakham ashvatham prahura vyayam ashvatham prahura vyayam then as chandamsi yasya parnan parnan is leaves so the leaves of this tree are the chanda chanda the vedic vedic hymns they call chandas so the vedic hymns are the leaves now what is the idea from the leaves flowers come from the leaves fruits come so the idea is that when one chant the vedic mantras one will get various material results so dharma artha kama will come from this tree when the leaves are uh, from the leaves as they come so from the vedic mantras they say the vedic mantras are leaves 
That means from them the various results will come up. Yastam Ved. So now somebody may say, I know these mantras and I can get these results. Krishna says, that's not what is knowledge of the Vedas. Knowledge of the Vedas is not just knowing the particular mantras. It is one who understands the whole tree. Yastam Ved, Sa Veda Ved. So here the word Veda, has, it is repeated, it is poetic alliteration. But the two Veda has different meanings. First Veda means to know. Second Veda means the Vedic literature. One who knows this, knows the Vedas. Yastam Veda, Sa Veda Ved. Chandam si yasya paranani Chandam si yasya paranani Yastam veda sa veda ve Yastam veda sa veda ve Sit together. Urdhvamulam dharshakam Ashvatam prahuravyayam Chandam si yasya paranani Yastam veda sa veda ve so Krishna starts with this metaphor and as he moves forward, he gives further elaboration. Now we could go into the specifics of the metaphor, but the important point is not the specific correlation of what this branch means this and then this means that. Krishna goes forward and he says that that karma nu bandhini manushyalo, okay, that by karma people become bound in manushyalo, okay. In human in the human form now karma does not apply to other living beings when a lion say pounces on a deer and kills the deer eats the deer the lion doesn't get karma because it's just acting according to his biological instincts but we humans get karma so we get bound over here but after describing this krishna's point is, is very clear he says he says Na asyeha that the form upalabhyate rupam is form Asya of the street, upalabhyate. Upalabhyate means to understand. Actually, the, the form of this world, <coughs> form of this tree cannot be properly comprehended. Hmm? Why? Because this is also endless. There's no middle, no, no, uh, there's no beginning, no end, no foundation. It's very difficult to figure that out. So Krishna has said, or rather, something similar comes in the Bhagavad Gita's 11th chapter, Narjuna is seeing the universal form and he says, Nantam na madhyam na punas tavadim. That there is, where is the beginning, where is the middle, where is the end? I just can't perceive it. So, the point is of not so much understanding the tree, but Ashvatthamenam suvirudangulam. This is a very deep rooted tree, but what we need to do is Asanga Shastrena. This is the key thing. That Asanga Shastra. Sangha is attachment. Asanga is detachment. So with the weapon of detachment, we require, we require strong determination to cut. Now what are we trying to cut? Krishna in the beginning has said that this tree is Avyayam. It's an imperishable tree. So we cannot actually cut the tree down. What we can do is, we can cut the things that bind us to this tree. Now, for, in that sense, for us, effectively, the tree will continue, will no longer exist. But it is more that we won't exist bound to the tree. So if we consider the tree is like the material world, then in the, uh, if we consider the metaphor of a prison, there will always be prisons in the world. But that doesn't mean a particular prisoner has to be forever there. The prisoner reforms, the prisoner will come out. So like that it is, this word asanga is exactly the opposite of the word which is used in a very significant verse in the Bhagavad Gita 1323. Purusha prakriti sthohi bhumte prakriti jan gunan karanam guna sangosya. So guna sangha. So why do we get caught in this material world? It is because of the desire to enjoy. Sangha. Bhumte, the desire to enjoy, but by that the attachment comes up. So the guna sangha, the desire to enjoy the products of material nature. Why does the person get caught in watching TV? 
because they want to see the various forms and the various moves and the various scenes that are described over there, that are depicted over there. So what are those? Those are the products of the various pixels that are there on the TV screen. So like that, Guna Sangha causes bondage and a Sangha can free us. So the person starts watching TV and gets caught in watching the TV. But if they want to stop watching the TV, <coughs> enough. I don't want to be involved in this now. So Asanga Shastrena Drudhena Chitva One has to be determined. It is not enough to say, oh, once I will not do this anymore. No. No. One has to consistently keep saying, cult keep cultivating detachment again and again. Now, after this, Krishna says that it is not just enough. Like somebody is watching TV and they stop watching TV. Okay. Uh, if they have nothing else to do, then what will happen after some time, they will again start watching TV. So he says, after we cut ourselves off from, from this world, then what we need, need to do? Tathapadam. Let's recite this. Tathapadam, that destination. Tat parimargitavyam. By the divine path, marga, we should seek that destination. What is the character's destination? Yasmingata. When you go there, one does not come back. Hmm? Tathapadam tat parimargitavyam Tathapadam tat parimargitavyam Yasmin gata nanivartanti bhuyaha Yasmin gata nanivartanti bhuyaha And then what happens? Tam eva chadyam Don't just go to that destination from where no one returns. But we have to do something in that destination. Tam eva chadyam After getting there, purusham prapadhyay Surrender to the purusha. Send her to the Supreme, so Supreme person over there. Prapadya is a very devotional word, surrender. And what is the characteristic of that Purusha? Why is that Purusha worth surrendering to? Because Yataha Pravritti Prasuta Puran. Yata means from him, this whole of existence is emanated. That's not just a person who is existing up there somewhere. Yes, he is existing up there. But he is not just one person existing somewhere. Like every people, every person has some house somewhere. That is the person from whom everything has come. That is the supreme person. So I say surrender to that person. So tamai vachadyam purusham prapadye. vachadyam purusham prapadye. Yataha pravritti prasuta purani. Yataha pravritti prasuta purani. So let's recite it together. Tataha padam tat parima gitavyam. Yes, ringata nadivartan tibuya. Tame vachatyam purusham prapadye. Yataha pravritti prasuta purani. So since time in Norway. Purani. Since time immemorial, it is from him the world has come out. So this is, so in the Upanishads, when this metaphor is mentioned, primarily it is about the upside down nature of the tree and we have to get out of it. That is the primary thing. But the Gita is giving us something more. What do we do after we cut off our entanglement with this tree? There is something more to be done. And then Krishna says, mm, we have to, Krishna will, here Prapadya is being said. So in the next verse, Krishna will elaborate in the process of Prapadya. How do we surrender? Mm. This is basically the practice of Bhakti. And then Krishna will say that, sorry. Proji, uh, in our Bhakti process, uh, it is said that uh, first develop attachment with Krishna and then gradually uh, the material attachments will be removed out. So how can we understand with mm -hmm. that line? Good question. So I will talk about this. See what is happening is Krishna is talking about the progression from Jnana to Bhakti. He is not talking about Bhakti itself giving Jnana and Vairagya. They are two different things. In the Jnana path, like today morning we discussed about the path of Dhyan Yoga. 
in the path of dhyana yoga the person first disconnects themselves from the world and then they start turning inwards and then they start searching what is there inwards and then they find vishnu so generally those who are in the path of dhyana yoga or gyan yoga they don't really know that krishna is the ultimate reality so that's why they have to have two distinct steps one is the step of process of detachment and then second is the process of discovery is discovery of what is there in the spiritual reality and sometimes they may get to the personal reality sometimes they may get only to the impersonal reality that's also possible so what is a two step process in the paths of basically in dhyan yoga or gyan yoga it is like first there is detachment or you could say specifically material detachment and after that there is spiritual discovery and if that discovery goes far enough then there will be devotional attachment otherwise it may be more of impersonal liberation also they might seek so here krishna is talking about this process of two step process so say 12.3 he is talking about not 12 15.3 he is talking about asanga shastrena drudhena chitva and then 15.4 he is saying that you have to develop find out that supreme person and then surrender to that supreme person <coughs> so there are places in the bhagavad gita when krishna is referring to the ultimate reality to the supreme person krishna refers to the ultimate reality of the supreme person sometimes in the first person and sometimes in the third person now what do you mean by first person that is mom hmm? mom i me my that is the first person then you your that is the second person and third person is he she they that is the third person so tam in sanskrit is the third person twam is the second person so sometimes krishna refers to himself in the first person sometimes in the third person and now this can sometimes seem confusing however there is a purpose over there why krishna is doing this if you will see sometimes the exact same thing krishna is talking about but he will use two different attributes for describing it so here we will see this that that particular abode from which no one no one returns go to that abode and then surrender to the supreme person that's what he has said in so he has used in 15.4 tam that that purusha to surrender but he has also said that the characteristic of that purusha is the purusha is in the place of no return the place where we go we will not have to fall back into this world now in 156 krishna will say my abode and he will say place of no return so essentially what krishna is saying is this 15.15.4 and 15.6 are saying the same thing that tam is mam so first let's see how these two are equivalent and then we'll see why krishna is doing this so let's see what krishna is saying now nat nat natat bhasayate suryo suryo means sun that place is not illuminated by the sun na shashanko na pavak not by the moon nor by fire yad gatva na nivartante in fact the word also is similar if you see what are the word over here na nivartanti bhuya gata na nivartanti so it's a very minor variation gatana nivartanti gatva na nivartante it is more or less same thing yet tad dham parmam mama now here the word that was used was padam padam means place dham also means place so that so that is my supreme abode 
you go to that place you won't come back natad bhasayate suryo na shashanko na pavaka na shashanko na pavaka yat gatva na nivartante yat gatva na nivartante tad dham paramam mama tad dham paramam mama so what is krishna saying over here that he is basically establishing that that is my abode so there are three different points to discuss in this verse but first let's continue what is krishna doing why is he sometimes referring the third person and sometimes the first person see it depends krishna's self references they depend on first on context and they depend on the level of the seeker so what is the level of the seeker mean that if the seeker that krishna is referring to is dhyan yogi or a gyan yogi now when the dhyan yogi and the gyan yogi is practicing dhyan yoga or gyan yoga is describing their practice then they don't know that the ultimate reality is krishna so when krishna is describing their search he is telling that they are searching for that ultimate reality so at that time when he is talking from their perspective he is not going to say they are searching for me he is just describing their path describing their journey so when he is describing gyan yoga or dhyan yoga seekers or even sometimes karma yoga seekers when karma yoga also anybody apart from bhakti yoga they don't know in the beginning that the ultimate decision is krishna so what happens is describing seekers they don't know when they know means they can either be ignorant or they may not have the realization to accept it krishna is the ultimate destination so therefore krishna when talking about their journey to uh, their path describes the path from their perspective and then he uses the third person reference he doesn't talk about it from the first person at the same time if the context requires it say krishna will talk about it from the first person so for example in general uh doctor may tell a patient that always follow the instructions of a doctor but if the patient decides that i want to take treatment from you then specifically the doctor may have to say that you need to follow my instructions mm-hmm. so there is a principle and there is a specific so the in in context a doctor's general instructions is that follow the doctor so when a general instruction is being given then krishna is say that okay just surrender to the ultimate supreme lord but when the doctor is treating a patient to that patient doctor will say follow my instructions it is why the difference because if that doc that patient doesn't want to come to this doctor that's okay now you say is it okay to not come to krishna well you can say ultimately that person will not get liberated but there are different pathways there are somebody can worship devatas also krishna doesn't say if you don't worship me you have to go to hell because of that so krishna may not refer to himself directly in the first person if the context does not require it so krishna the same thing will come in the 18th chapter in 1862 when krishna is broadly outlining the path he says tameva sharanam gacha sarva bhavena bharat in 1861 he says ishvara sarva bhutana ruddeshi arjutishtati he says that there is the ishvara in the hearts of all living beings and surrender to that ishvara and then after that what does he say he says 
that 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 Ishwar is object to surrender to. Then after that, just four verses later, Krishna will say, "Sarva dharma an paritajya maam ekam Why? Because in we in between, our, Krishna says that now you are I have given you my message. You deliver it and do as you desire. So Chakravarti Pad explains that Arjuna starts thinking, what, what should I exactly be doing? And Krishna sees Arjuna's heart. Krishna has said to Arjuna, do what you desire. But Arjuna is thinking, what is Krishna's desire? And when Krishna sees that he is so eager to know what is my desire, then Krishna will say, what is my desire? Surrender to me. So that thumb will become mao. So like, uh, so a doctor may say that, okay, you can now follow this treatment, this is available at this hospital, if you follow this treatment, follow this, uh, this, this, uh, this facility available, or follow this treatment, this is available over here, now you decide what you want. But if the patient, if say, somebody's child is sick with cancer, and the doctor is giving them various options. Now if the patient says, doctor, if this were your child, what would you do? And the doc that doctor will say, you know, you just, Take admission in this hall in my hospital. I will take I'll take care of the treatment. So when the patient when the patient or the client expresses that trust, the doctor also takes responsibility. So Krishna reveals himself accordingly. So now yeah, I have written a whole book on this topic called Relishing Bhagavad Gita, where the two books broadly, much of what I spoke in Bhagavad Gita Insights and Relishing Bhagavad Gita. So where all Krishna talks about himself in the first person, where all Krishna talks about himself in the third person and why he does that. All of that has been elaborately analyzed, but we won't go into specific examples too much. It's a little technical. But the point is, it's not that there is Krishna as one Supreme Lord and there is some other Krishna Lord that Krishna is talking about. Because Krishna is talking about the same person, but from different perspectives. <laughs> Depending on who, about whose journey he is speaking to and what level of surrender the person who is receiving the instruction has. So here now, in the first five verses, Krishna has outlined the Upanishadic worldview. Hmm? He has to refer to the Upanishadic metaphor and he has outlined the Upanishadic worldview. And now Krishna is relating that Upanishadic worldview with the worldview that he has given. And that's why he will say that, yeah, there is that abode from which no one comes. And that is actually my abode only. Mm -hmm. So he's linking the Upanishad, the description of the ultimate reality, the elaboration or extension of that metaphor with this description. So now when he says, Natat Bhasit is Suryo, that in that, that place is not illuminated by the sun, moon or light. Now what does this mean? Does it mean it's dark? No, the point is, it is self-luminous. That it does not require any external luminosity. And this exact reference will correlate with the later verse. Here Krishna says three elements, sun, moon and fire. And six verses later, Krishna will refer to the same thing. He says, above, when he is talking about this word, yet adityagatam tejo jagat bhasyatyakino. Adityagatam tejo is the sun, Aditya is the sun. And yet Chandramasi is Chagnau. Chandramasi is moon. Agnau is fire. So Krishna is saying that this world requires these sources of illumination. And these sources of illumination come from me. So that so that, that, that's this correlation. That world is self-luminous. This world is not. So the emphasis is on not that these are these are not these don't illuminate the world. That they, these are not required over there. It's a self-luminous world. Now, Prabhupada in the Prabhupada in the translation itself says there's no electricity also over there. Now, what is Prabhupada doing over there? Now, somebody will say if somebody is a literal literalist in translation. See, whenever translation happens, there are two ways of translating. There is a way to cover, there is literalist translation or there is literal translation or there is essential meaning to be conveyed. 
and this will lead to two different approaches. Say to understand this difference that which is a more useful way. Say imagine there is some Sanskrit uh, book on Ayurveda. And it has descriptions of remedies for many diseases. Some very simple remedies which can be taken at home and people can be cured. There are some sophisticated remedies which can even be adopted by hospitals and mainstream doctors. And now this is to be translated into English. So that, because English is the main, audience, main language in the world, one of the main languages. So we want to do that. Now, who is a, com a competent person for this? One could be somebody who is a linguist, linguist scholar. Linguistic scholar means that person knows Sanskrit and that person knows English. Bilinguistic, you can say. That person knows Sanskrit and English. Now, the other is an Ayurvedic doctor. Hmm? who has treated based on that book for 50 years and that person knows some basics, basic Sanskrit and that person knows basic English. <coughs> now here this, this scholar may know both the languages well and from a purely linguistic perspective this Ayurvedic scholar may not have that level of proficiency in either language. If we had to take a treatment and we had two of the, we had translations by both of these people, which translation would we use? Ayurvedic doctor. Ayurvedic doctor, isn't it? Why? Because that person has worked with that book. So it is a bit of an ego trip to consider that just because somebody knows a language, they can have mastery in any book written in that language. So just because I know English doesn't mean that I can explain a book on quantum physics in English. You know, it's, it's a complex subject. Of course, you could say anybody who wants to explain quantum physics, they have to understand English. But mastery over English is not the basis, uh, not the most important qualification for explaining a book on quantum physics. You have to have mastery over quantum physics. And sometimes there may be a brilliant quantum physics professor who may not be very good at English. But still, their knowledge of quantum physics will be more reliable. So, what happens is, sometimes there are scholars who may translate very precisely in terms of literal translations. This word means this, this word means this. Okay, but the problem with that approach is they have not lived the book. They have not inspired others to live the book. So essential meaning is more important than simply the literal translation. So when Prabhupada says his book is Bhagavad Gita as it is, what does he mean by that? There's one Western scholar, he said, he especially Prabhupada's sixth chapter. He just he just gets so enraged. At Prabhupada in the sixth chapter, Krishna is telling, go go to the forest, which of the Ishtabya. And Prabhupada says, in Kaliuga, this method is not practical. <laughs> uh, we should chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> uh, he says, This Swami, who does he think he is? He says, he is cancelling Krishna's words. First, he has the audacity to cancel Krishna's words. And then he has the double audacity to call his Gita as Bhagavad Gita as it is. <laughs> so, many people have a little trouble in understanding Prabhupada's Gita. And little trouble is a little understatement. <laughs> some people have some amount of trouble. Prabhupada seems to translate Karma Yoga as Bhakti Yoga sometimes. Hmm? Prabhupada says Karma Yoga is Krishna Consciousness. Hmm? So here, here the example I am giving is Prabhupada is putting electricity over there. So now what is Prabhupada doing? 
So to understand this, let's look at three broad things. First is coverage. Coverage means what is Prabhupada covering? Covering means, so the word cover has two different meanings. What are you covering? Cover means uh, spread. You know, this 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 book this book covers a wide range of topics. But cover can also mean conceal. Isn't it? Are you covering something? Are you hiding something? You don't cover up. But if you look at Prabhupada's coverage, Prabhupada is giving us the Sanskrit. He is giving us the transliteration. He is giving us the word to word translation. He is giving the synonyms. Then he is giving us the translation. And then he is giving us the purport. So he is giving us a lot. If Prabhupada, some people say Prabhupada is biased toward bhakti because he is from the bhakti tradition, he is just giving bhakti everywhere. Well, if Prabhupada wanted to do that alone, then why? Would Prabhupada even give the Sanskrit? Why would Prabhupada do the word to a translation? Prabhupada could just have put his translation and somebody had to see. They would actually have to go to the Sanskrit text and they say, okay, Sanskrit text is saying this, Swami is saying this. Yeah, there's something mess over here. Now Prabhupada himself clearly lets people see the Sanskrit word is Karma Yoga and Prabhupada puts in his translation Bhakti Yoga. So Prabhupada is certainly doing something extraordinary, but he is not concealing it. So in both senses, Prabhupada, is he concealing? No. Is he spreading out and giving everything? Yes, he's giving everything. So that means Prabhupada is being transparent in what he is doing. He's not concealing or hiding anything. He's giving us the Gita as it is means. One meaning of as it is is he's giving us the Sanskrit. He's giving us the word for word translation. He's giving us the transliteration. So as it is, it is giving it in full to us at one level. The original text text he is giving it in full. The second point is that when Prabhupada is teaching us the Gita, what is his approach? He himself has clarity about his approach that Prabhupada said that his purpose is that in this age people don't read much says, even if somebody takes one page they should get the essential message just read one page they should not miss out of the essential message so Prabhupada is very clear in his approach that he wants to give the essence everywhere. He doesn't hide that. Now, when so that is so this is out of his compassion. So he is clear about his purpose that any purport that anybody reads, they should be able to get the conclusion. Now, at one time, Prabhupada said that Prabhupada uh, talked about various other books that he would like to write in the future. And one of the books that he mentioned was Bhagavad Gita. And Prabhupada said, the devotee said, Prabhupada, you already commented in the Bhagavad Gita. Prabhupada said that there are, no, there are so many acharyas who commented on it. There is so much that we can write on the Bhagavad Gita. He said, you would like to write another comment on the Bhagavad Gita. So that means, Prabhupada, when, say, when Prabhupada says this is Bhagavad Gita as it is, he is not saying that this is the only Bhagavad Gita as it is. He is saying that anyone who gives the conclusion of the Gita, that person is giving Bhagavad Gita as it is. So Ramacharya is given, uh, the way his Vaishnava Acharya is given. So Prabhupada is clear in his purpose. He wants to make sure the conclusion is given everywhere. Now that is the second point. The third point is, it is, now we may say, how do you know what is the essence? Somebody may say that, you know, different people, they are different commentators and different commentators consider different things to be the essence of the Gita. So now, see the Gita is inclusive. The Gita has sections for the Jnanis, Gita has sections for the Yogis, Gita has sections for the Karma Yogis. The Gita is inclusive 
but just because it is inclusive does not mean that it is inconclusive hmm? how do we know it is con conclusive because when we come to 1866 krishna himself is giving a very categorical conclusion <coughs> sarva dharman parityajya maam ekam sharanam vraja put aside everything else and just surrender to me so what does that mean if the whole gita is about dharma krishna is saying yes i have talked elaborately about various dharmas various ways in which one can do the right action but right now i'm going to tell you that which is the highest and in fact the previous verse also emphasizes this that that i have spoken i said two verses before that 1864 krishna says that now i will speak the highest sarva bhuyatamam bhuya shrunu me paramam brahmacha i am going to speak the highest words so the preface to this the two verses before this they clearly indicate it's not just a one off statement that krishna is making krishna is categorically establishing a conclusion over here so krishna gives a conclusion to the gita and what prabhupad is doing is you see there is krishna's flow of thought this is the rough estimate approximation of flow of thought where he is building up to bhakti yoga as a conclusion now what prabhupad is doing in his purports is what krishna gives in the conclusion prabhupad gives throughout the gita hmm? now when prabhupad is giving throughout the gita what is he doing over here if you see that prabhupad is not unaware of the subtleties of the flow of the gita say for example towards the end of the second chapter the last purport prabhupad says krishna has now given in this chapter a hint of bhakti yoga the hint of bhakti yoga means krishna is 2.61 he says one one fourth of one verse tani sarvani sanyame yukta asit mat paraha focus your consciousness on me that is the only reference to bhakti in that chapter but prabhupada in his purports talks about ambarish maharaj using his eyes to behold the lord using his hands to clean the temple using his legs to go to the holy places so prabhupada is not giving us a glimpse prabhupada is giving us a full picture so the point is that prabhupada is not unaware of the gita's flow but prabhupada is not so much getting into technicalities of that flow prabhupad is consciously choosing to focus on the concluding message now especially if you look at chapter transitions often the last verse of a first cha of a chapter or the first verse of a chapter you will see that prabhupad is clearly talking about the structural flow of the gita but he doesn't do that in all the verses that is not his priority is like a doctor in a suppose a doctor is in a pandemic at that time the focus is on creating a manual that patients can that patients and medical care givers can use to treat people at that time all the technicalities of everything they may not be necessary at that time of course what is required for treatment is required necessary but so prabhupad what he is doing is, is prabhupad bhakti the fact that the prabhupada's commentary is bhakti biased and is it bhakti biased no it is not bhakti biased it is bhakti centered hmm? bias means you know there is no bhakti in the gita and prabhupada only put bhakti in the gita no krish the gita itself is bhakti conclusive and prabhupada's gita commentary is bhakti centered so what krishna is giving in the conclusion prabhupada is giving throughout the gita and he is not hiding it so in terms of these three things coverage clarity clarity of purpose and conclusiveness the so prabhupada is so the gita is itself bhakti conclusive now of course you can say gita is not bhakti conclusive and you can say also bhakti centered in the sense that the center of the bhagavad gita 6 chapter 6 to 7 to 12 is bhakti only conclusion is under 1866 but now the bhagavad gita as it is mm -hmm. 
it is sorry as it it is i so is it b g a i is it okay bhavita as it is so what is it it is it is bhakti centered or it is bhakti focused hmm? so throughout the bhakti message is being given and prabhupada is not hiding krishna's words prabhupada is giving what krishna has given the conclusion throughout the gita so why am i discussing all this now when prabhupada is you adding electricity over there so you know whenever there is communication there are two broad purposes of communication to get it right whatever the point you have to get it right but a more important purpose per point per more important is to get it across get it across means that the point has to be understood so right talks about precision of articulation that i should be able to say it right that is important but get it across means accessibility for audience does the audience understand it so now when prabhupada is speaking to a modern audience for most people yeah is the moon or the fire the source of illumination well the sun yes but how many of the people think as you know the i am going out for a walk in the moonlight yes yeah, some people do that not many and how many people use firelight you know not many for us the prominent source of illumination is electricity so what prabhupada is doing is the essential point that there is no source of that there is no requirement for any external source of illumination that is the key point that prabhupada is giving and how is he giving it by explaining by adding electricity over there now he is not changing the sanskrit words to add electricity over there in the sanskrit he is giving the sanskrit words as it is but he is giving hmm, giving a further elaboration in his translations so prabhupada has a particular approach and the approach is to make sure that the essential meaning is conveyed prabhupada is a person who has lived the gita who has inspired others to live the gita so he is like that ayurvedic doctor who has treated people and somebody could go into the specifics of okay this word and this word and what its meaning that's fair enough somebody has a has the interest to do that somebody has the Uh, energy to do that, the time to do that, and they can do it. But if somebody who spends a lot of time, energy, interest in doing that, and they in the process don't take the treatment that is there in the Ayurvedic doctors, in the Ayurvedic manual, then what is the use of it? See, the Ayurvedic medical book is meant for treatment. It is not just meant for linguistic analysis. So that's why the essence of the Gita. is what prabhupada's gita gives us so bhagavad gita as it is means that the ultimate purpose of the gita as krishna himself conveys at its conclusion is systematically emphasized by prabhupada okay so now what is in this particular section what is krishna doing krishna has started by using the upanishadic metaphor and then he's connecting with the world view that he has given now after that he will say that yes that is the eternal abode but we are all in this world but all the souls are in this world and in this world they go through transmigration and in this world they are disconnected from krishna in this world they are caught in illusion and how do we come out of this world krishna will first start with gyana before coming to bhakti but interestingly when krishna talks about gyana generally speaking in the upanishadic attitude the gyana refers to seeing the atma seeing oh there is something by gyana chakshu you understand see atma see brahman or basically you could say seeing the spiritual then that way one can understand how things are being revealed that rather uh, how there is a higher reality beyond this world but when here in the gita 
Krishna talks about Jnana Chakshu. Chakshu is the eyes of knowledge. So when he is talking about the eyes of knowledge, he does mention that. Hmm? He does mention that briefly. But his focus is on seeing God's role in our maintenance in this world. That while we are here in this world, because the focus is on how one can actually surrender to the Lord, how one can devote oneself to the Lord. See, in Jnana, the idea is first you understand you are not matter, you are spirit, detach yourself from this world, come to the spiritual platform, and then you can find out what is the spiritual reality and then you surrender to God. But when, if you have to practice bhakti, then we are in the material world, and now if we can see God's role in the material world, then we can feel connected to God, we can feel devoted to God. So, let's see how Krishna does this. First, let's look at this particular verse. Krishna does acknowledge the general Vedic vision that Pashanti Jnana Chakshushaha. So, what does he say? The soul is caught in this world and Utkranantam, how the soul suddenly departs from the world at the time of death. Sitamva, how exactly the soul is situated in this world. In, sorry, not in this world, in this body. And why the soul is situated in the body? Bhunjanam va gunanvitam. How the soul en seeks to enjoy or enjoys the products of the three modes. And this was what was mentioned in the 13th chapter, right? We all enjoy the products of material nature. So, like a person watching TV. So, how exactly the soul is caught in all this? He says, Vimudha. The people who are bewildered, nanupashanti. A person who is deluded, a person who is too materialistic. Like somebody is caught in watching TV. They can be so caught in watching TV, they just forget the other world. And somebody says that, you know, come on now, you have to go for your office. He says, you know, Sundays I don't work. It is Wednesday today. Uh, really? Get lost, don't disturb me. Say so that people can be completely lost. We moved her. So, in fact, how the soul transmigrates, that is also uh, quite a, a vivid, vivid metaphor can be given to do it. Say, somebody is watching TV. And they are so caught in watching TV that a thief breaks into their house. And a thief comes and looks around, what is valuable over here? The TV is valuable. So the person picks the TV and goes and is going away. And this person who is watching the TV is so caught that instead of stopping the thief, he just follows and keeps watching the TV. <laughs> <laughs> so like that, actually at transmigration, the Yamadutas when they come, they grab the subtle body. The subtle body with the mind is like the TV screen, it's the TV basically. And they, the Yamapash applies to the subtle body. But the soul is so attached to a subtle body, the soul keeps watching and goes away with it. <laughs> so that's why Utkramantam, how the soul goes out of this body, how the soul stays inside the body. All this, it requires Pashanti Jnana Chakshusha. One sees with the eyes of knowledge. So let's decide this first. Utkramantam sthitam vapi Utkramantam sthitam vapi Bhunjanam va gunanvitam Bhunjanam va gunanvitam Vimudha nanu pashyanti Vimudha nanu pashyanti Pashyanti jnana chakshushaha Pashyanti jnana chakshushaha So, Krishna is telling that we need the eyes of knowledge to see. And Krishna does talk about the Atma, the eye, with the eyes of knowledge you can see the Atma, but with the eyes of knowledge you can also see Bhagavan. So that he will describe in the, uh, in the 12th verse onward. But let's decide this verse once together. Putkramantam sthitam vapi bhunjanam vagunarvitam vimudhananu pashyanti pashyanti jnana chakshusha Then basically from the 12th verse onwards, Krishna is telling how our very existence is sustained by Him. So seeing God's role in our maintenance in this world, what Krishna is doing is, 
from the 12th verse 12th 13th 14th and 15th so each of these i won't go into the specifics but we'll focus on the principle over here krishna is saying how he maintains us at the cosmological level the sun maintains the universe and krishna says the sun is arranged by me the sun gives us light from me then he talks about the terrestrial level terrestrial is the earthly level he says the earth is floating in its orbit and that gamma vishya cha bhutani the mechanism of gravity is arranged by me then he talks about why we are in this world we are in the body at the physiological level krishna says the mechanism of digestion that enables us to transform the food that we eat into energy is it it is i who sustain that mechanism of digestion the scientists are trying to make now uh, artificial organs to replace uh, organs if they are not working so if somebody has limb is not working hand is not working have prosthetic limbs heart is not working they have a pacemaker kidneys are not working can have dialysis units but you know if some digestion is not working they find it's very difficult to make artificial digestive machine because the digestive process is so complicated that even with nano technology or very kind of advanced technology what we will need is not a machine we will need a factory to convert food into actual energy that the body can use it's a extremely complicated process how does it happen we don't even know it the only time we think of our digestion is when it doesn't work <laughs> <laughs> so basically what happens is god gives and forgives god gives and forgives we get and forget so but if we contemplate a little bit we can remember and finally krishna says at the intellectual level mattah smriti gyanam apohanam cha he gives each one of us the kind of knowledge remembrance and forgetfulness by which we can function in the world and the soul goes from one body to another body how does the soul know okay when a lizard it just pops its mouth open and catches an insect how does it know it is krishna who is giving it the instincts by which it can function so we don't necessarily have to become spiritual to see god's role in our world we can see god's role even at the material level if it is a little perceptive that okay my existence it's not just uh, my doing there's a lot more going on over here that god is playing a role in my life now what happens many times we are not able to perceive god's role because we don't see what god has given us we see what god has given others and we see that i don't have this and that makes us so when we talk about gifts there are gifts in life hmm? gifts in life means okay somebody may have this ability somebody may have that ability somebody may have wealth somebody may have looks somebody may have a high iq there are gifts in life but there is the gift of life and this is the most <coughs> valued and the most undervalued so actually speaking the gift of life should be what is most valued but we just have it we take it for granted and we think you know why don't i have this ability and why don't i have that ability and why this why that so and we just don't value oh, actually our very life itself is sustained by god and if we are just alive that means we are blessed by god that means god has a plan for us that if we are just alive that means god has not abandoned us if god had wanted to abandon us why would he continue maintaining us so no one is ever abandoned by god no one is ever rejected by god even if that person abandons or rejects god god does not do that so we need to be able to perceive that at a foundational level the gift of life 
is precious. And all of us, you probably all of you around 18, 18, 20, 18, 20, 20, 22, 25. And probably I'm the oldest around 45. But if you look at the world around, there are so many people who die before they attain the age that we have attained, isn't it? So now we can say, how have we survived? Well, of course, we say, I use my intelligence, I work hard, I've done this, I've done that. Of course, that is true, no doubt. But if things had to go wrong, so many things could have gone wrong at any time. Isn't it? So the fact that we are alive means God has not abandoned us. That God is still acting in our life. Of course, even if we die, God will take us to the next life and he'll be with us at the Paramatma. But we are talking here from the perspective of a material vision. Material vision means even from the vision in this world, we can see God's role in our life. So we can look at the gift of life every day that we have. That is a gift from God. And so much is required for our sustenance. So we look at that and we understand that, okay, that is, yeah, I am working hard, no doubt. We don't want to, we don't have to deny or downplay our work. But our work in say our maintenance, I want to speak of later our success, our maintenance, there is our work and there is God's arrangement. Now both are required, but actually speaking, our work is in many ways secondary and God's arrangement is primary. How is that? It's like every morning when birds start chirping, chin, 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 chin. what are they doing? They're going, they're hungry. Maybe they're searching for some grains. Now they have to search for grief, no doubt. That is like our work is like birds seeking grains. God's arrangement is the providing of grains. No matter how much the birds search for grains, unless God has provided the grains beforehand, they will not be able to find it. So from the overall perspective, their searching is not creating the grains. Their searching is to find what God has already provided. So each one of us can actually cultivate gratitude by appreciating at a fundamental level the gift of life. And then beyond that, we can look for specific gifts in life. And yes, we may have some gifts, somebody else may have some other gifts. So what happens often, uh, there are people who are jealous. Okay. Oh, 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 we are going to be in trouble. We have to finish the class now. It's only 5%. Can you see if you put a charge over here, what happens? Okay, good. It's actually... I think your light will not be affected, my light will be affected <laughs> here. So, see, so you know, the jealous are actually very good at counting blessings. But the problem is they are very good at counting the blessings of others. <laughs> 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 oh, you know, this person has this and this person has that, that person has that. But it's like you can count our blessings. And if we look for that, if we just put ourselves, you know, cut off who has got what blessings. Just focus on ourselves. Try to observe ourselves with open-mindedness, curiosity. We'll find each one of us has some <coughs> blessings. <clears throat> Most of you know that I need crutches for walking. So when I was one, I got polio. So basically, my doctor, my, my parents had taken uh, me to a doctor for getting a polio vaccine. And I was living in a small town in Maharashtra at that time. And somehow the doctor who was supposed to do that vaccine made a mess of things. So the fridge in which he had kept the, kept the vaccine, uh, the power supply had gone off over there. So what happened was the, the germs in the vaccine, they multiplied because of lack of refrigeration. And then when he gave me the vaccine, that was to prevent polio. 
but because the germs were so much in it that the vaccine ended up giving me polio. And then, so I was just walking normally one day and I fell down and I could never walk after that normally. Now, I don't remember any of this. I was very small. My parents told me afterwards. <coughs> but my first memory of this is, I was probably around two and a half, three or whatever. <clears throat> so some neighbors or relatives had come to our home and that part of the memory is vague for me. They said, they were consoling my mother and saying that it's so sad that your son got polio. And my mother, I remember her voice, very clear, confident. She says, whatever he lacks physically, God will provide him intellectually. Now, I don't know really at that time what signs of intellectual ability I had shown. I was so small. <laughs> so maybe it was, you know, maybe my mind would mother was a sharp observer or Krishna inspired her to speak that. But whatever happened was that the statement sort of registered within me. And naturally I couldn't play like other kids, I couldn't run around. That was a limitation. But then when I started studying, I noticed <coughs> that I could understand things much faster, remember things much faster, articulate things better. So then, somehow, I got that assurance that I may be lacking in something, but I am also good in something. And it is that I started identifying myself with much more of my intellectual side than my physical side. So I love to read, I love to study, I like to teach at that time also. So basically, we all have some gifts. Now we can look at things we don't have and we can feel sorry for ourselves. Or we can look at what we have and we can focus on using those gifts. Now I could say that, oh, at least from this life's perspective, I, I didn't do anything. The doctor messed up, that's why I got polio. That's true. But then if I am really honest, I can say from this life's perspective, I didn't do anything to get my intellectual ability also. Isn't it? So whatever we get in this life, it's a mixed bag. There is something negative, something positive. So we can see God's role in our life also if we just can remove the filters or remove the sort of the distorting glasses of comparison. If we just comparing with others, we will feel always our gifts are inadequate. But if we just look objectively, we'll talk about this worldview towards the 18th chapter when we talk about Swakarmanatam Abhyarchi. But the point is, that each one of us, we have been given some gifts and we can use those gifts in a mode of service. So, now after this Krishna will say that he will talk about Brahman, Paramatma and Bhagavan which is a complicated subject which I won't go into but he says after we see God's hand in our life then who is that God? Where is this coming from? We gradually start realizing that there is a person who is overseeing this reality. So, once we realize that, that is the time when we start becoming focused on the ultimate reality. So, in the 16th, 17th, 18th verses, he talks about Brahman, Paramatma and Bhagavan. So basically, what do we under, what is, what is, how is this connection going on over here? That we can see in this world, there is something beyond that is maintaining me. And then after that, we start exploring what is that thing that is maintaining me? What is the nature of that reality that is maintaining me? So there, now, okay, I was planning to speak some other point, but I'll just speak this point and we'll conclude with this. Uh, that... Uh, this is a big point, but and it is a little demanding, but this particular three levels, it's very helpful to understand <coughs> this. See, all three in one sense are one. Hmm? They are not different. Brahman, Paramatma and Param Bhagwan. it's not that like Brahman exists here, Paramatma exists there, Bhagwan exists there. <laughs> they are all one reality. Hmm? The example to el illustrate this is say, if you consider Gulab Jamun. And we say, what are the Kulab Jawar going to do with Brahman, Paramatma, Bhagavan? <laughs> so, 
suppose you know there is a prison hmm? and there is just outside the prison a gulab jamun shop <laughs> <laughs> and now the prisoners walk along over here hmm? and now say there is a wall which is completely non transparent so all that happens is the smell of the gulab jamun comes across <laughs> <laughs> so those who are inside they get only the smell and they this thing smells very good and they have no idea what it is so now what happens is for them for them they have got only the smell and based on getting the smell they come up with a name for it let's say they call it gulla <laughs> this is a gulla this is nice. now suppose mm, mm, this prison has another wall another prison over here and now this wall is transparent so now they can along with the smell they also have sight hmm? they can see hey this this smell is delicious and this this you know brownish spherical objects in some nice looking juice so they see they get the sight also hmm? and now they have the smell and the sight but that is all that they have so they come up with this is a nice object they come with a name for a jamu <laughs> now suppose one of them comes out and they go to the shop and then they have they already had the smell they have the sight and then they have the taste so they have all three they taste it this is the full experience and then they get the full experience of the gulab jamun now the gulla jamu and the gulab jamun uh, <laughs> they are not three different objects they are the same object but they are different experiences of the same object they are based on experiencing different features of that object so jeeva goswami in the sandarbha he doesn't give the specific example but <laughs> <laughs> but he says that based on experience of different facets of the ultimate reality see all three brahman parmatma and bhagwan all three of them are sat chit ananda <laughs> however when a seeker perceives seeker and feature of absolute truth that is perceived so when the seeker perceives only the sat aspect of the absolute truth so that is like the realization is he says it is realizing the absolute truth without any energies so what does it mean he is saying that while we are existing in this world and there are constant changes going on in this world we understand that there is some existence beyond this world and that existence is like a endless expanse of white light and that is what is eternal everything that is happening in this world is temporary now that just exists and we are meant to go there and attain that so in that sense it's just unending existence that is the absolute truth without any energies that's we are, we are experiencing only the sat aspect of the absolute truth so this is the brahman realization the seeker here is generally the gyani and now somebody may realize the sat plus the chit aspects like the somebody getting the smell and the sight of the gulab jamun so when this happens at that time they understand that there is not just 
like a eternal existence of a stream, like an ocean or an unending stream of consciousness that is up there. So their idea of Brahman, generally whenever consciousness is there, whenever there is consciousness, there is the consciousness comes from a subject and goes towards an object. Isn't it? Let me say, if I am here, and I am, you are here and you are looking at the screen. So, the, you are the subject of consciousness. The screen is the object of consciousness. And in between is the stream of consciousness. Isn't it? So, the stream of consciousness is going there. And then you are observing and then you are understanding. So, the, the impersonal idea is that both the object and the subject are Maya. So they say the only thing that exists is the stream of consciousness. So what we perceive is all Maya and the one who perceives also is Maya. So now if you ask them how can consciousness exist without perceiver or perceive? They say that is the nature of Brahman. So, generally consciousness means there has to be somebody who is conscious, isn't it? But that is their idea, that the very idea that there is an object and a subject that creates duality. And we have to go beyond duality. So, their idea of Brahman is, there is just this eternal stream of consciousness. Now, you remember in the ninth, when we talk about uh, Mayavada, we talked about in the 12th chapter, we talked about how they say the desire is the problem. Hmm? Different people think different is the problem. The Mayavadis think desire itself is a problem. And they say, now I mentioned over there, whenever we have consciousness, we'll have desire. So they say it's not when you are conscious you have desire. They say when there is subject and object, that is when there is desire. If there's only consciousness, without subject, without object, there'll be no desire. Which sounds interesting. So they say, Aisa dhyan karo, Aisa dhyan karo. कि कौन ध्यान कर रहा है किसका ध्यान कर रहा है उसका ध्यान न रहे नाउ इन टर्म्स ऑफ इट्स 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 एक्चुअली वेरी गुड इट इज इन टर्म्स ऑफ सब्जेक्टिव एक्सपीरियंस दैट इज इमर्शन दैट इज अब्जॉर्प्शन दैट वी कंप्लीटली लूज आवर सेल्स इन अब्जॉर्प्शन व्हाट एवर वी आर थिंकिंग बट देयर इज अ डिफरेंस बिटवीन subjective immersion and objective dissolution. See, when we go into that kind of absorption, something it's possible. We all, in psychologists also talk about something like a flow state. You get into a high performance state. Somebody is doing work and they just forget everything. They just are lost in the work. So that is possible, but that is more of a subjective immersion. We get immersed in it. But that doesn't mean that we don't exist in the world, it doesn't exist. We don't exist in the object of meditation. It's just that at that time we are immersed. Like the gopis, when they are searching for Krishna, they are so maddened. They are just completely lost in Krishna. Unmadandha. So that is a valid thing. But what they are saying is, they are converting what is a subjective experience of absorption into an object to dissolution. Dissolution means they dissolve the idea of the subject and they dissolve the idea of the object. So that is not real. So in the Advaitic idea, in the impersonal idea, Sat is the only thing that is existing. It's only the stream of consciousness that exists. And there's nothing beyond it. But if we consider how does consciousness exist on its own, that's a philosophical problem. So now the, the, the yogis who perceive the par Paramatma, what happens is they perceive the Sat aspect and the chit aspect. So it's like the prisoner who perceives the smell and the sight of the gulaj. So that means here he says it is absolute truth with material energies. What does material energies mean? That, that, that the material world, it is not that the Brahman exists up there and this world is just going on random. That that spiritual reality is also overseeing this world. 
so in the very rigidly mayavadi world view the idea is everything in this domain is the world is in the domain of maya it's just what happens is it's all chaos it's all maya just get out of here and get back to god but in a more evolved understanding yes this is the domain of maya but maya is under the supreme lord so that's why the app that eternal unchanging reality has material energies material energies means the energy to oversee and control material existence so that is a second level this is the level which krishna talks about in the text 17 and after that there is the perception of sat plus chit plus ananda this is the perception of absolute truth with material and spiritual energies <coughs> and there is this perception of both material and spiritual energies this is the perception of a bhakta and this is the perception of bhagavan now what does this mean when we say it's with material and spiritual energies essentially yes god is overseeing this world but beyond that there is another world and there also god has loving reciprocation of this world that other world is not just a endless ocean of white light of just a stream of consciousness it is actually filled with god who has divine emotions it is there are spiritual energies over there there is there is the antaranga shakti and there is reciprocation so the idea is that basically this is the most complete perception of the absolute truth that we perceive the absolute truth as sat chit anand now the important thing over here is the absolute truth is always sat chit anand even brahman is sat chit anand but see the gulab jamun always had has as smell taste smell sight and smell form and taste it always has all of this but the perception might be of only one feature so when there is complete perception of the absolute truth that is the time when there is the deepest conviction so krishna can conclude this chapter by he talks about these three levels of realization so what is happening we see god's hand in the world and then we see what is the nature of that god or oh, there is some existence beyond that existence is overseeing this world that existence also has a life beyond in the in the life beyond means that existence in the many religions the idea is god is a judge well yes now one of my friends is a judge he just became a high court judge so he is telling me that i he has a passion for law he always had it is still if, if if a judge is all that i had to be throughout my life 24 by 7 i'd be frustrated and if god has to be judge not just 24 by 7 for all of eternity it's you know yes being a judge of this world being a overseer of this world is only one small part of god's role god has his own self existence and there he's in delighting in loving reciprocations this is the highest understanding of god and krishna says yo mam eva asammudho one who understands me in this way asammudho not being bewildered understand that this is the highest reality janati knows me to be purushottamam yo mam eva masammudho yo mam eva asammudho janati purushottamam janati purushottamam such a person so sarva ved now ved is to know sarva ved is to know fully that's it the idea is you know sat aspect you know chit aspect you know the sat chit and and aspect so sarva ved bhajati ma that person starts worshiping me how sarva bhave na with the whole heart with all the emotions generally even when we seek to love someone in the world to we want to protect our heart also so we offer some love but we hold something back but when we understand krishna in the ultimate reality 
who has been maintaining us in this world and who also exists beyond this world. And that Sarva Bhavena, with all our emotions, we start worshipping Bharata, Krishna Ji, Arjuna. So this is the way through the complex maze of Jnana, one comes to the conclusion of Bhakti. So, Sa sarva vid bhajati maam Sa sarva vid bhajati maam Sarva bhavena bharata Sarva bhavena bharata Let's recite it together. Yo maam eva masam mudho Janati urushottama Sa sarva vid bhajati maam Sarva bhavena bharata now, as if this is not a categorical enough statement, Krishna will make an even more conclusively categorical statement. Iti Guya Tamam Shastram. That among all the knowledge of Shastra, this is Guya. Guya is confidential. Tamam is most. Like in English, there's superlative good, better, and best. So Guya, Guya Tara, Guya Tamam. This is the most confidential knowledge. Iti Guya Tamam Shastram. Idam uktam maya anagha. Oh Arjuna, you are sinless. Anagha. So to you I have spoken this knowledge. Idam uktam. And etad gyat, etad buddhva. Once you know this, buddhiman syar. Actually, that person, like we have dhanvan, is enriched with wealth. So buddhiman is filled with, enriched with buddhi. Etad buddhva, buddhiman syar. And then he says, kruta kruttesya bharata. Kruta kruttesya means, your actions will be successful. That your actions will know not just success, but the supreme success. So in this way, Krishna very categorically is saying, this is the conclusion. This is the ultimate reality. So, I'll summarize what was discussed in this chapter. We discussed the chapter 15 and we started by talking about how Krishna is answering Arjuna's question about how the Jnana worldview and it, how it overlaps its relationship with the Bhakti worldview. So what Krishna does is the Jnana worldview is described in the Upanishads. So first Krishna starts with a Upanishadic metaphor. What is the Upanishadic metaphor? Yes, the upside down tree. And that is described from 1 to 5. And then he says, within that metaphor, exp explaining and elaborating on that, extending that metaphor, he says, and we don't just want to cut ourselves off from this tree. We actually need to go beyond and find the person from whom everything has come and surrender to that person. Now, after describing this, what Krishna does is, then he starts describing how in 15.4 that ultimate abode is the same as in 15.6. So here there is a third person reference and here there is a first person reference. So we discuss elaborately about why this difference. So it depends on context. Does Is Krishna speaking to someone who is surrendered to him or not, like a doctor may say, you should obey the doctor. But that patient, that patient is saying, I want to take treatment for you, then obey me, the doctor may say. Now there is the level of the seeker. Hmm? That when Krishna is describing the journey of a Jnana Yogi or Dhyan Yogi, then they don't know that the ultimate reality is Krishna. So while referring to them, so for Jnana Yogi, Dhyan Yogi, Krishna will use the describer Tam. For describing, or even for Karma Yoga also. For Bhakti Yoga, Krishna will use the word Ma. So now Krishna is linking the Tam and Ma. Tameva Sharanam. And Sharanam Ma. Ma, ma Prapadyate. Like that. So, Yasmin Gatana Nivartanti Bhuya. Yad Gatvana Nivartanti Ma. Tad Dhama Paramam Ma. So then, we discussed elaborately about Shila Prabhupada's approach to the Gita. What he is doing is, he is giving us, we discuss three things, coverage. No, he is not hiding. He is actually, he is giving, full he is giving in one sense. Not hiding anything. Then we discuss the clarity of purpose. His point is that he wants to give a commentary in which 
the essential message <coughs> is there in every purport and then conclusiveness now how do we know what is the essential message we look at the gita itself so the gita has its thought flow culminating in 1866 now what prabhupada is doing is if this is the gita this is the purport so prabhupada is giving the conclusion not just at the end but throughout and prabhupada is not hiding what he is doing he is transparent so we discussed how when we want a we want a translation we can look at a linguist who is a scholar or we can look at a person who is a practitioner so if you want ayurvedic book which is to be translated uh, then we could look at we would rely much more on a person who has actually used that book for treating people so prabhupad is like that and in that sense when prabhupad adds electricity what is he doing over here he is giving the essential point the essential point is the spiritual world does not require luminosity so there is getting the point right and there is getting the point across so this is much much more important now after that we discussed about gyan chakshu so krishna has said that okay that he is the eternal he is the eternal lord and we are disconnected from him and we are struggling and suffering in the world so gyan chakshu can mean two things first is we see spirit spirit means we see the atma beyond matter i will discuss the example of how the soul goes from one body to another it's like a thief stealing the tv so like that the yamadutas they catch the mind and the soul goes away with it but gyana chakshu can be also mean god's role in our life and in that connection we discussed how the gita reveals krishna's role at four levels at the cosmological level at the terrestrial level at the physiological level and then at the intellectual level so in four verses that how it is krishna who is giving us intelligence and all that so from 12 to 15 and then after that we discussed if we want to feel grateful it is that we often look at the gifts in life but we need to first look at the gift of life that we are alive itself is a miracle and it requires many factors beyond our control our efforts are secondary for our survival you know it is our if god's arrangement is primary ours is secondary so in this way we can become appreciative that there is a higher reality who is working in my life and based on that then we can start exploring what is the higher reality and in that connection we discuss the example of the gulab jamun and the progressive perception first one might just perceive the smell then it could be l plus sight we look at the we perceive smell and sight means we perceive the form and then after that smell plus sight plus taste so like that the absolute truth can first be perceived only as sat that means there is just a stream endless stream of consciousness without subject or object this is the absolute truth with no energies it is just existence <coughs> then we perceive sat and chit so this is with material energies this is the parmatma aspect that it is not just this world is maya and that that is the only reality that what is happening in this world also has some rhyme and reason to it there is some order to it and that is because the parmatma is governing it and then after that we perceive sat chit and ananda that is the that is the bhagwan aspect it is with material and spiritual energies this is the bhagwan aspect and once we understand this to be the ultimate reality 15 as krishna says we will be whole hearted surrender sarvabhavena bharata whole hearted devotion actually 
bhajati and in this way we can all become attain the perfection of life we can get the most confidential knowledge from scripture that guhyatamam shastram and krita kutyashcha bharata our actions will know the supreme success thank you very much hare krishna hare are there any questions or comments yes please Hare Krishna Prabhu. Prabhu, you were mentioning about the, the 18.66. Krishna is emphasizing on the uh, essence of Bhagavad Gita in 18.66, and whereas Prabhu is emphasizing across the Bhagavad Gita, the same one. Mm. So even when we do preaching and all, like which approach we should follow? Like Prabhu is able to give out of compassion, giving essence everywhere, <coughs> and or else Krishna is giving the Bhagavad Gita only, but in step by step manner. it depends uh this is an ongoing topic of discussion in our movement so there are uh, there are there is a significant audience there for the direct message of bhakti also at the same time there are many who are not ready for that and should we cater for them or should we just leave them so there are some devotees who feel that prabhupad came to give krishna consciousness alone mm-hmm. now there are others if you see the first purpose of iskon <coughs> prabhupad says to correct the imbalance of spiritual material values of society by systematic spiritual education so systematic would mean it's step by step from where people are isn't it so what that would mean is that if you want to correct but the imbalance even increasing sattva guna in people is good so some devotees may feel more inspired to do that kind of outreach and that's okay so if you look at the seven purposes of our movement it is prabhupada is quite inclusive that like uh, explicitly devotional purposes are only two express like hrnam sankirtan and Uh, to build a place dedicated to the worship of krishna the others are quite general is educate systematically then to help people come closer to each other and closer to krishna the prime entity to publish literature for these purposes so there are multiple purposes so prabhupada's vision was quite broad now during his manifest presence prabhupada did emphasize particular things but then his purposes were quite broad so i my understanding is that if after a certain number of years each devotee will have to find out how what kind of outreach inspires them the most and then focus on doing that <coughs> initially of course it's best to understand the message and follow our guides but uh, it is possible to do both also it is possible to say do an outreach at the level of dharma at the level of nishkam at the level of encouraging people to karma yoga helping people to come to sattva and simultaneously we can provide people resources for coming to bhakti so the two don't have to be contradict so for example now if we have a place where there are a variety of things available so for example if you consider the govardhan eco village i'm giving this example just because i'm familiar with it there may be other projects also the this is a this is a place where if you invite people to come to a temple they'll come if they may not come they'll come they'll come for a few minutes look at the deities and go away but if you create a retreat center it's close to nature people want to be close to nature there are there are cows there are other animals over there there is environmental friendly structure which people can observe there is uh, there, there is natural scenery over there there are lakes there are there is a beautiful traditional temple with architecture there is yagya sthali happening there are various things happening there is educational university over there so the vidyapeeth so many things are there so the idea is we can give people many reasons 
to associate with devotees. And just by that association, they will become inspired. Now, some may take the journey all the way and become large, become devotees. Some may become well wishers. And both are good. So, what is a concern, and I would say it's a valid concern, if the majority of our movement starts focusing only on sattvic outreach and we, we leave bhakti aside. So, it's that if we consider the journey toward Krishna consciousness, if we con consider this to be like an inverted funnel. So, and if you have funnel like this, okay, forget it. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, this is better. <laughs> so, if you can say there is tamas, there is rajas, sat, sattva, and there is shuddha sattva or bhakti. So now. Is our purpose only to get people all the way up here? Now we can say we can go here and get all the way people up there. Or if somebody comes from here to here, or here to here, or here to here, can we do all of this? I don't see any reason that we can't do all of this. But the concern is that we shouldn't be just our movement, if our movement can do all of these that if our movement can all of this, do all of this, then that's good, that's excellent I would say. But if we get caught in say only doing this, <coughs> then it would be from a spiritual perspective it would definitely be a problem. Still we will be doing some good to humanity, but we won't really be taking <coughs> people to Krishna consciousness. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Prabhuji, like uh, Krishna says that I am the Supreme Personality of God and, and come to and come to towards me. So, does it Krishna really need Jivas or he is only safe for our welfare? Does Krishna need his what? Jivas. 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 Does Krishna need his well? That's the speciality of now one way to understand the dynamic of the relationship. It's, it's like we need Krishna, but we don't want Krishna. That means actually we cannot exist without Krishna. And we may not realize that we need him, but we need him, but we don't really want him. That means that we don't have much of a desire for him. It's like when I need God, I go to God and then thank you, goodbye. It's like that. So it's almost like we offer the minimum necessary consciousness to Krishna and then go on with our life. So we need Krishna but we don't want Krishna. But Krishna doesn't need us, yet he wants us. That is the nature of his love. He is Purna. It is not that he, uh, he will be incomplete because we are not there. He is Om Purna. He is complete. And yet, he wants us to join in his completeness. To delight in his past times of love. So he doesn't need us, but he wants us. And in, generally we say, we say, we should focus on our needs, not our wants. That is, that is true in a material sense, but here, if I want someone, even when I don't need them, that means what? Actually, it is not at all selfish. It is completely selfless. So Krishna's relationship with us, Krishna's relationship with us is like that. He doesn't need us, yet he wants us. But probably Krishna has infinite number of souls, so... 
Why Krishna not take care of him? Why Krishna care for all the jiva? All the jiva should come. Yes, that is his infinity. See, he has infinite number of souls, but because he is infinite, having so many souls does not mean that he gets exhausted. He can be individually available with everyone, and he, he, sorry, he cares for everyone. There is that in the Vakati Suprabhatam, Vakati Sutram, there is Kalavenu Rava Vashya Gopavadhu Chitta Koti Pratat Smara Koti Samad Prati Vallavi Kavi Matat Sukhadad Vasudeva Sutana Param Kalaye He is a scribe and Krishna is playing his flute. At that time, one gopi comes running, another gopi comes running, another gopi comes running. And although the gopis come in like streams, like waves, they keep, not streams, waves they keep coming. And Krishna very joyfully welcomes each gopi to the Rasmila. Yet Krishna is eagerly anticipating the next gopi that is coming. So just because, so we know in the Rasmila what happens is, Krishna expands to be there with each gopi. And Krishna values and cares for each gopi. And that applies not just to the gopis, it applies to every one of us. So yes, Krishna has many, many countless devotees with him. But that does not uh, diminish his love for us and his wanting us. So, yes, bro. Uh, Krishna is not only the Lord Thank you for the class. Prabhuji, a very chapter Krishna says, and um, nine chapter is that I'm giving you the most confidential knowledge, and then later mm -hmm. in the 15th chapter here also he mentioned that I'm giving you Kohyatam Shastram, yes. and then in the 18th chapter also. You'll say that, yes. Some, so, how, how do we understand the, the nine chapter itself is most confidential? No, we are, we, it's not the matter of chapter, it's the matter of the content of the chapter. So, what is being said over is there is bhakti. So, bhakti is the most confidential knowledge. In 9th chapter, what will he say? Man mana bhav mad bhakto. And same thing, the verse is say, na bharata bhajati maam. So, it is the same thing. So, it is the same. And Krishna himself says, bhuya. I am saying it again. For clarity, for emphasis. Krishna is saying it again. So, it is not that Krishna is giving different knowledges and he is calling them as most confidential. At different places, he's stating the same thing, but he's arriving at that point from different perspectives. And then he's saying, yes, now I have arrived at the conclusion. This is the most confidential. Okay. Okay. But Bhagavad Gita is like the most widely available and yeah. now is it most confidential? Okay. So the confidentiality of the knowledge is not so much about the physical availability of the texts. Hmm? The confidentiality is about the openness of the heart. Generally, Krishna often talks about Anusuya, you are not envious of me. So what it means is that if our heart is open, then we will, that is the portion of the Gita, we will be able to look at the Gita and say, this is the most important. But if our heart is not open, then we will catch on to other aspects of the Gita. This is the most important. This is the most important. So the confidentiality is that okay, so the, the Sanskrit is a complicated language, or rather, translation from one language to another is, is a complicated business. So the Sanskrit word is guhya. Now, sometimes it can be translated as secret. Now, a more appropriate translation, more apt translation is, is private. Now, what does private mean? Say, if there is some ceremony happening at home, there is a marriage ceremony or something like that happening. Now, uh, uh, the husband is talking with some other guests. And the wife comes and taps on the shoulders. Can I have a private word with you? Now, when he says, he says private, that doesn't necessarily mean it's top secret. It just means that it is not relevant to others. 
So then the husband will go outside and they will talk with each other. So it is not relevant. So private doesn't necessarily mean secret. So it's 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 within the context of that relationship and whatever the responsibilities in that relationship. So similarly, when Krishna is speaking, at that time, when Arjuna opens his heart to receive the glories of Bhakti, at that time what Krishna is speaking is for someone who is open-hearted for the message of devotion, for the loving connection with the Lord. For somebody who is not open for that loving connection, then that knowledge is not so relevant. So confidential is in those terms. Okay. But uh, in conclusion, uh, like Krishna himself, like basically gives the conclusion. So can anyone even refute it? Uh, like focus on this part of this part. When uh, no, they say that this was Krishna is speaking for the bhaktas. That's that is a very uh, it's a very arrogant way of labeling something. Presumptuous, not arrogant, presumptuous way of you know, this verse is for the bhaktas. <laughs> so Krishna is speaking this verse for the for, well, is Krishna saying like that, you know? <laughs> so so see, when somebody wants to wants to focus on some particular conclusion or particular aspect of the conclusion, they will come up with the reasoning. And that is the meaning of Mattahasmita Jnana Abhavanach. Krishna will give them the remembrance of particular sections and forgetfulness of other sections. <laughs> and that's how they will come to their own ideas of what is the conclusion of the Gita. One question here, which this is. Krishna says, I am the fire of the digestion, which you are mentioning that uh, like digestive system is so complex that we have to make so many factories. And then you say that God gives and forgives. Can you please better No, forgives means that, see, if somebody has given us some gifts and we don't even acknowledge, you will not feel grateful to them, we don't even acknowledge that they have given us the gift, we don't even acknowledge their existence. And that is certainly a, not a healthy thing to, not a proper way to behave. So in that sense, we completely neglect God's uh, role or uh, even existence at times. And still, Krishna is kind to us. So that's uh, the idea of God gives and forgives. So thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavad Gita Ki Jai. Srila Prabhupada Ki Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Ki Jai. Dai Gaur Premanand. Thank you.